chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, if you'd stand with me as we reverence the Word of God. Luke chapter 4. Notice, if you will, verse number 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness him, uh, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings and benefits of this week. We thank you for these that have gathered on your holy day. Father, we ask for the next moment or two that we can just ponder you. And Father, that we can draw close to you. And Lord, it's my desire and it's my prayer that before we leave this room this morning, we would know that certainly you were here. Father, thank you for all that you do. Father, for these unworthy creatures we are. Thank you for giving us life and the ability to function and the ability to be here this morning. Father, thank you for Miss Betty special, Miss Judy special. Thank you for the congregational singing. And thank you, Lord, for all of those that had special chores to do this week around the church. Father, we're so grateful. But Lord, now is our time. Lord, it is your time. I pray, Father, we'll use it for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we read the passage before us, Jesus is coming back home. He arrives back to his boyhood village of Nazareth. Certainly, he knew every house and shop, and he knew people there by name. He knew things like who baked the best bread and who was the most honest in their business dealings, and he also knew who was the most generous. The sights and smells told him that he was back home. As you read the Bible, one thing is stands out in the life of Jesus, and it's this. He would attend the local synagogue on the Sabbath day. And no doubt here, rumors were flying that Jesus is back home, and uh, things would just, certainly on this particular Sabbath day be a little bit different. Jesus had left Nazareth uh, some years ago and it attracted a little bit of fame by now and he's coming back home and the hometown boy had struck it big. And so no doubt that this synagogue would be packed. Jesus would remember this place, this local synagogue, and it was special because Joseph and Mary would bring him here and the rest of the family to worship. For many years, this was Jesus' place. For many years, this was a family's familiar place. What memories this synagogue must have brought back in the mind of Jesus. In this synagogue, the seats of honor were filled by those who were deemed important. The rulers of the synagogue and the local rabbi would conduct the services. But one thing in the local, in, in, in the Jewish lore was simply this. When you had a, a, a traveling, uh, rabbi, often they would be the one that would read the scriptures that day. And certainly it would be no different during this time. Jesus' fame had already gotten back to his hometown and uh, they handed Jesus the scroll. And if you know anything about your Bible, Jesus quoted Isaiah, and this is interesting, Jesus quoted Isaiah chapter 61, the first two verses. It was a well-known passage for those Jews. Many would know it by heart. And Jesus' words this day were different and it would have an impact for sure. The Bible says he closed the scroll He would have returned it to the keeper of the scrolls and then he sat down. And no doubt during that time you could have heard a pin drop. A sense of holiness had returned to the synagogue. By now this whole countryside was talking about Jesus and his miracles. And let me just tell you something that you already know. Many that day gathered simply because the hometown boy had come back. But many that day gathered because they thought that they were going to see some form of miracle. Not only did they think they was going to see some form of miracle, they wanted that above anything else. Now, if you'll stay with me this morning, I want to show you something. Many times, the miracles that you seek and the miracles that I see is nothing more than that still small voice and the Lord speaking to us in a service quite like today. 
You see, sometimes we bypass that. We want the thunder and the lightning. We want something great come down from the sky when all the while Jesus was simply would just tell us that if you'd listen to your heart and you'd listen to what I want to tell you and instruct you, that's going to be your miracle. Beloved, let me just tell you this. Miracles occur every day because Jesus is still on the throne. People are still being saved and the church is still being uh, out there in our communities and people are getting closer to Christ. But can I tell you this? What we need today is not some form of lightning in the sky and not that Jesus would set down in a physical sense, even though he is here in a spiritual sense. What we need more than anything is just to listen to that still small voice so that you and I would understand his will for our lives. See, that that particular day, there were many curious onlookers, no doubt. And it's interesting that the prophet Isaiah, Jesus, now watch this. Jesus read a familiar passage. Now watch this. I want you to, I want you to get this. Jesus says, Isaiah wrote this many years ago, roughly 400 years ago. Now watch. Jesus was saying that Isaiah wrote this. Are you ready? About me. Now, we understand it this side of the, uh, of, of Jesus saying this. But when the Jews heard this, you know what it would be akin to? It would be akin to me saying something like this to you. It would, I would say about a week before Christmas, I would say, now on December the 25th, we're all together and we're going to worship my birthday. Now what would you think of that? Well, he's obviously off his rocker. We're not going to worship his birthday. But can I tell you, when Jesus says that the prophet Isaiah is speaking about me, what do you think his hometown people thought? Now, wait a minute. They'd already watched him grow up. They'd already knew his mom and dad. They already knew his siblings. They understood Jesus' business practices. Now, Jesus, and watch, Jesus is coming back home to Nazareth, and he's making this grand declaration, and he's saying this, I am the Messiah of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're sitting in the synagogue that day, you would be a skeptic just like those people were because they knew this young boy. They had watched him work. Even though they had heard about the miracles over in Capernaum, even though his fame was coming back home, there was something, yeah, there was something different about him. But but for Jesus to claim to be the Messiah, I don't buy that. They're, listen, we're waiting on the Messiah and Jesus don't want to break your heart and don't want to say anything ugly about you. But quite frankly, you're not it. Quite frankly, you don't fit our definition of the word Messiah. Are you still hanging with me this morning? You see, this is the dilemma that these people were in. Jesus didn't look their part and they could not believe that a hometown boy could absolutely do this. Now, I thought it was interesting. And just imagine, now watch this, just imagine the scrutiny that Jesus was under. Let me give you a little story. When many, 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 many years ago, Pop moved us and our family down to Tennessee when we were small children. And he went down there to attend Tennessee Temple University. At that time, under the tutelage and under the uh, watch of Dr. Lee Robertson, it was a fine, fine fundamental college. Now we can't say that. But he went down there, and, and, and it was a struggle for Papa. It was a struggle for our family. And finally, he got through Bible college. Somebody invited him to go back to Olton, Texas, and preach a sermon. And I'll never forget the sermon. Maybe not as one of the ones that you'd write down in a book, but the building was packed. A hometown boy is coming back to preach. What's so significant about this is Papa's re- reputation was not one of the best. Because they remember that on Saturday nights when he used to get locked up. They remember when he was a difficult person. They remember him growing up. And all of a sudden, Olton announced that he's coming back to preach. Now, a lot of people just simply could not believe that. As a matter of fact, a lot of people thought that was just some form of joke. So when he went back and went back to that Baptist church over in Olton, Texas, many years ago, back in the 70s, the church house was packed. Why? They wanted to see a hometown boy come back and they wanted to see, maybe they wanted to see him fail. Maybe they wanted to see something that they weren't accustomed to. But they came back, he preached a message and they simply could not believe that a boy could come back in his hometown and be a preacher of the gospel. Why? Because they know what he come from. Let me tell you this, beloved. You know what? Sometimes our harshest critics are our own family. Sometimes our own harshest critics, and, and let me be gentle when I say this, some of us sit in church. 
You see, when we start to get close to God, and when we want a when we want a new vibrant relationship, when we want to see souls saved, and when we want to see the church packed out, when we want to see the Spirit of God rain down, and we start moving our life into His direction, I'll just assure you of this, beloved. Sometimes you're going to be knocked down because people listen. People don't want you to get close to God. They don't want you to be more than they are. They want you to stay at the same place spiritually speaking that they are. So Jesus sweeps back through. Nazareth. He goes to the local synagogue. The keeper of the scrolls hands him a scroll and he does something and he reads Isaiah chapter 61 and he reads it in such a way that it had such an impact in their hearts. Now, I'll prove to you in just a minute, there were many, many distractors at that at that particular time but what I thought was interesting is verse number 22. Even though there were people that did not even want Jesus, even though there were people that just was a skeptical of Jesus, in verse 22 it says, the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Listen, they, listen, even his distractors could not deny the fact that there was something special about his words that day. But they did not leave it at that. For in verse number 22, look at this, Brother Chris, I don't know if you can pull up verse 22. I want to show you something at the end of that verse. Look what it says in, 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 I don't know if you can keep scrolling. Look at the end of that verse, one more time, and it says, And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Even though his words were with power, even though his words were with 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 something that we've never heard by the scribes and the Pharisees. But then they said, is it not Joseph's son? You know what they saying? That was a very derisive term. That was a term of not endurance. That was a term that they were slandering Christ. Before they says, man, his words were of power. He had gracious words. It was words that we've never heard in a long time in this synagogue. But this is Joseph's son. He don't have the credentials. He's not went to the local school or the college of the day. He did not graduate with credentials. How in the world could he speak like this? So listen, and so instead of just listening to his words, here's what they started doing. They started tearing down him. Have you ever noticed that today? Listen, if you can't find fault with the message, if you can't find fault with the words, just tear the messenger down. Just slander the messenger. Just tell them that he's no good and that what he's got to say is not important. Friend, can I tell you, Jesus went back home and they said, this is this not Joseph's son. How in the world could this guy under this circumstance, under this home, grow up and he's claiming to be Messiah? I don't think so. Wow. Very, very interesting. No sooner had these words spoken by Christ than the attacks come. Now mark this down. Many here could understand what's going on because you too have been in the end of a poisonous tongue of those that claim Christianity. Sadly, some of the most painful words and hurts have been uttered by professing Christians. Can somebody understand what I'm talking about? Consider this rather humorous story. A guy by the name of Leslie Flynn writes this. A father who was in his study reading and he heard a commotion outside the window. It was his daughter playing with her friends. But the commotion got louder and louder and more heated and argumentative until finally the father could not restrain himself no longer. He pushed open the window and said, Stop it, honey. What in the world are you doing? After the reprimand, the little daughter quickly says, But daddy, we're just playing church. Sadly, that goes on. And see, Jesus was coming back to this particular locale and things were fixing to ratchet up. So l l let me get to the heart of the matter. Now watch this. If you have your Bibles, look, look, go back to Luke chapter 4 and I want to show you a verse that we did not read. Luke chapter 4 and verse number 23. Notice <clears throat> something very interesting. So Jesus is going back to his hometown, tends the local synagogues, reads out of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, he wrote this and then, and, and, the, and Jesus understood the reaction was building and it was impossible for these people to understand that Jesus was the Messiah. So now Jesus gives them some illustration. Now watch this. Everybody look up here. Let me give you something. Here's what you need to know when you read your New Testament. Often when Jesus gives you a life principle, then usually he illustrates exactly what he's talking about. And he's fixing to do that for you right here. Are you, are you caught up to speed with me? Look at verse number 23. You've got to see this. Jesus is speaking and he says this. Ye surely will say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself 
Now watch this. Whatsoever you have done, uh, you have heard done in Capernaum, uh, do also here in this country. Here's what they were accusing Jesus, and Jesus was making this reference that I thought was very, very, very interesting. The people wanted Jesus to do in Nazareth what he'd been doing elsewhere. According to some in that synagogue, if Jesus did not bring down lightning, or if Jesus did not raise the dead, and if Jesus did not do some kind of mighty miracle, he would be like a physician, watch this, who can help others, but not himself. Are you following me so far? Now watch. These people wanted a magic spell, some kind of miracle, but they did not want Jesus' words. And to make an interesting statement, Jesus tags this, no prophet is accepted in his own country. You see, they wanted the miracle without believing in Jesus. Friend, listen to me. Watch, watch. I'm not so sure that we're not doing the very same thing in our culture, in our land. We want miracles, but we just don't want Jesus. We want Jesus to come down and bless us. We just don't want to live for Him. We want Jesus to come down and, and lift all of our burdens, except we just don't want to go to church. We want Jesus to do everything for us, but we want we don't want to pray, we don't want to tithe, we don't want to do those things that Jesus wants us to do. You see, we want a Messiah. We want, listen, we want a Santa Claus to, 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 to give us our little gifts and then leave us alone. The trouble with some of us today is we treat Jesus just about like that. Well, now, Jesus, you don't understand. I've got these burdens and where are you? Come on, come on, come on. I'm in a hurry. Come on, take this from me. But Jesus says, why don't you serve me? Well, I understand that, but I don't have time. Why don't you go to church? Oh, the church is not an important commitment this time. Why don't you make a commitment to me? No, Jesus, you don't understand. I just want the gifts, but I don't want the giver. Jesus is going back home, and that's exactly what Nazareth told him. Listen, we want all your benefits. We want your gifts, but we don't want you. We know who you are. We know who your family was. We know your daddy. We know your mama. We know your siblings. And quite frankly, Jesus, you just don't measure up. Do you think maybe conversations go on today like that? Do you think maybe people are pondering the very solutions like this and said, yeah, my life is empty. Yes, I'm not doing everything that I ought to do. And there's got to be an answer out there. But I'm just not so sure that Jesus is my solution. So let me just give you a couple of things and then we'll we'll speed on. Look at verse number 18. Look at verse number 18 in Luke chapter 4. Here's what Jesus says. Now, I'm, I'm just if Jesus said it, I'm thinking that that's pretty good. Now, watch this. Jesus is saying, speaking of himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because, why? He hath anointed me, now watch, here's what he promised, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, amen, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So he gives us four things, now watch this, he gives us four things that he says that he does in our life. Number one, he says he's going to preach the gospel. Now, before you fall asleep on that, let me give you this. Beloved, what's wrong with our churches today is we've got away from that. We've got away from the gospel message. Well, preacher, it's just usually the same old, same old. And it's just usually, well, listen to me. I don't know about you, but if we ever get tired of the gospel message, something is wrong inside of our hearts. Listen, it always has to be the gospel message. This has to be about Jesus Christ. So he says, Jesus himself says, I'm going to preach the gospel. Now, I don't know about you, but if we're going to imitate Jesus, maybe that ought to be one of the places we start. Then number two, he says, not only am I going to preach the gospel, but I'm going to promote wellness. I can make you well. Now, thing, I, listen to me. I don't know about you, but every one of us in here have got some kind of uh, uh, issue, probably health-wise. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that Jesus had a deeper meaning than just health. I'm thinking when Jesus says, I can, I can promote wellness, what Jesus was saying, there is a spiritual hunger. There is a spiritual lack in your life that if you'll listen to me, I can help you with that. Amen, preacher. There is something spiritually inside of you. Now what? When God created you, He created you with a vacuum and it needs Jesus to fill it. He created you with that longing that you know in your heart this morning that you're not right. Now listen to me. If I ever had to go up to you and say, are you a sinner or not? I'm just pretty sure some of us would say, well, preach, I don't like it when you say it like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm probably a sinner. Let's just, let's call it something that it don't sound so bad. Let's just say that I make mistakes. Let's just call it uh, error in judgment. Let's just say that I've 
I've slipped in my past. No. Jesus says you're a sinner because that simply means you missed the mark. And see, friend, listen to me. We don't like to hear those words. We like to soften it up a little bit. We like for, I like for you to tell me, well, preacher, you're this, but don't, don't, don't make it so harsh. Just calm it down a little bit. We're not sinners. Let's just call it this. All right. Everybody look. Everybody look. We're a mistaker. Now see that, see how smooth that is. When you come to church, you're not a sinner. Bless your little hearts, you've just made some mistake. That's what the churches are feeding you. That's what people want you to understand. And see, if you tell me that I make mistakes, that don't sound near as bad to me as if I miss the mark. If It don't sound near as bad to me if you tell me that I am a sinner, not a mistake. You see, listen to me. I want, listen, in my life, I would just rather somebody come out and just tell me the unvarnished truth instead of beating around the bush. Amen. I would rather somebody just tell me just exactly how it is. I don't want to be strung out. I don't want you to just to pat me on the back. Just tell me, bless God. If you're not going to come to the church, don't make these promises. Just simply tell me, no, I'm not interested. I can live with that. Amen. Friend, listen to me. We've got in a society that we want to change the labels on things. Jesus says, I'm not interested in changing the labels. I'm interested in just telling it just exactly like it is. You are a sinner, not a mistake. Or, amen, friend, listen to me. We're not going to dolly this up. We're not going to make it smell better than it does. <laughs> Jesus says, I came to preach the gospel, to promote wellness, and to proclaim deliverance, and to number four, to purchase freedom. Amen, amen, amen. Now let me quickly, while my time is, before it runs out, Jesus gives us some examples of this. Do you remember in the Old Testament, Jesus went to this widow woman, and he gives, and he talks about this in chapter four. So that you understand this, uh, let's see, let's skip down a little bit and go to verse number 25, Luke chapter four, verse number 25. So he's everything he's just said, everything that Jesus is trying to tell him, he's given them some illustrations. But I tell you the truth, men and widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. Now watch this. But n- unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto the Septilia, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Watch this, watch this, this is interesting. Jesus was saying, let me give you an example about how you are refusing me this morning. Now watch, watch, are you with me? I'm, I'm facing close, watch this. He gives them this powerful example. He says, do you remember the Old Testament? Now wait a minute, the Jews was there. Do you not think they knew the Old Testament? So here, Jesus has given them some examples that they already knew. And he's saying this. Do you remember about this poor widow woman when it did not rain for three years? And Elijah came to her. You remember this? And he, and he was telling them this story. And Elijah came to her and he did these miracles. Now watch this. He did these miracles. As a matter of fact, he did a couple of miracles. He made sure that the meal would never run dry. And he also restored the dead to life. You remember this? Wait a minute. What's so significant about this? Elijah did not do that to a Jew. He did that to her. Wait a minute. Who is it that God this day has sent a place to you? Jesus says, you remember I told you that a prophet is not even uh, uh, accepted in his own country? Let me give you an example why. Then he gives them this example, and then he gives them the example of Naaman. Do you remember this guy in Second Kings where the leprosy, Naaman was a great man and a great captain, but he had a problem called leprosy? Now, wait a minute. He was a Syrian. Think about this. He wasn't even a Jew. Guess who got healed? Who was it? It was a Gentile, not a Jew. Jesus has given those illustrations. So he's saying all of that to say this. He says, listen, you didn't accept me. And you know why those people got delivered? You know why God poured out his favor upon the Gentiles and not the Jews? It's because they accepted. They were not in that idol worship. They did not reject me like you Jews did. And Jesus has given them this harsh sermon and th- these illustrations. And these Jews are sitting there getting madder and madder and madder and madder about what Jesus is saying and then it climaxes with this as a matter of fact it is so important you need to see this for your own selves the day jesus was kicked out of church notice luke chapter 4 verse 28 and all they in the synagogue when they heard these things those illustrations that many messages jesus preached the bible says they were filled with wrath This was no ordinary wrath. The Bible says that people were filled with wrath or hatred. The people were set on a blaze. Why? Because Jesus told the truth. 
You know what? You tell the truth today and people are not going to like it. People don't want to be told they're lost. People don't want to tell. We don't want to tell people they're going to hell. People don't want to hear those things today. Now think of something. These people who are so mad at Jesus, this was not done outside. This was done inside. Now I'm trying to hurry. So, and I'll skip some of this. Let me give you this. Jesus went back home to his local church. Many of those people in the church knew Jesus. They watched him grow up. He said these things. They got so mad at him. Watch. Some of his boyhood friends. Some of the people Jesus grew up with. They're the ones that's in the crowd. They're the ones that got so been out of shape with Christ. But the Bible says they did something that's so unbelievable. If it wasn't in the Bible, maybe we wouldn't even believe it. The Bible says they got Jesus out of the synagogue. And they started pushing and prodding him and pushing and prodding him and pushing and pushing and jabbing him. Now you have to understand this had to be a large uh, mob that day. Why? It's because a hometown boy had come in, right? Somebody tell me, amen. A hometown boy is coming in. So all of these people are coming together in Jesus. He's saying these words are getting madder and madder and madder. So listen, they don't want to change. They don't want to be called a sinner. They're a mistaker. So they, they understand this. They don't want Jesus. They don't want Jesus to tell them any truth. So instead of changing their hearts, they decided to kill Jesus. The, listen, around Jerusalem, or especially around Nazareth, it is commonly re re reported there that there is a known hill that's about 40 or 50 feet high. So it's estimated, it's, it's some Bible scholars believe it's on this particular precipice that they push Jesus out to. And listen, now watch this. Right in the middle of all of this, they were fixing to shove Jesus off. Wait a minute, that's not what Jesus... Now, here's the part that many miss. Are you ready with me? All right, everybody, everybody just breathe a minute. I'm fixing to sum up, okay? Here we go. You remember just a few moments they got mad about Jesus because He didn't razzle them and dazzle them with a miracle, right? What we miss when we read this story is that as they were pushing Jesus and pushing Jesus and fixing to launch Him off the cliff, Jesus just walked right in front of them. The Bible doesn't say how He did that. The Bible doesn't say... Did he just get invisible? Did he just, did everybody freeze? And he just kind of walked like, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. We do know that he walked right through the middle of them. Now watch this. I'm not so sure that that's not a message that we need today. Jesus walking right through the middle. So he walked right through the middle of them. And he understands this. He says, that is not my time to die. But those people there that day were so bent out of shape about Jesus. Instead of accepting his message, they wanted to kill him. Now. Let me give you this and then we're done. These are the somber words and I started studying this and it's interesting. Are you ready? Watch, watch this, watch. When Jesus left Nazareth that day, it's not ever reported after that incident back. Now what's that got to do with you? Well, let me tell you how we'll, we'll tag this to you. In our land right now, when we kick Jesus out, how do we know he's going to come back? How do we know? You see, in the Bible, when you booted the Lord, he just went to another place, to another place, to another place. And here's what we're seeing. Every time you boot Jesus out, evil comes in. Every time Jesus is out, evil comes in. So do you think maybe there's a correlation in our land today? We've booted Him out from government. Now, does anybody in this room honestly say that we have a noble and right government? Can anybody say that? We've kicked Him out of our homes. Can anybody say that all of our homes are godly today? No. We've kicked Him out of our schools. Can anybody... Anybody say that we have godly schools today? No, you can't say that. Why? Because we kicked him out. So they kicked Jesus out of Nazareth. He never went back. And you do know what? If it wasn't for Jesus, you probably would have never heard of Nazareth. He's the one that's the reason that place is famous. Because let me just tell you this. What made America great is because years ago we brought Jesus over to this shore. Now here's what I don't understand. Jesus has prospered us above all nations on the earth. And now we've got to the time in our life that we feel like that we can boot Him to the shore, boot Him out and say, all right, Jesus, You took us this far, but we'll go the rest of the way. Christians, we've done that with our personal life, with the way that we're thinking nowadays and the way that we do things nowadays. We're saying, we'll just take it from here, Jesus. We've got it under control. You've taken us this far, but we really don't need You anymore. You know, after all, we're enlightened now. After all, we have, we, we have knowledge now. After all, we have the internet now. We don't need Jesus. Anything we ever needed to know, all we gotta do is click. And there it is. Amen. Pity the person that rejects Jesus and kicks Him out of their life. Because let me just tell you this, you may not get 
another opportunity. Are you telling me? No, 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 no. I'm just telling you. When when Nazareth kicked Jesus out, it's not it's not recorded in Scripture that he ever ventured that way again. His hometown says, we don't want you. Jesus probably, listen, he probably was very, very sad over that, but he's a gentleman and he's not going to force himself upon nobody. You either accept him as he is or you reject him, but he's not going to force the issue. Friend, can I tell you this? Wouldn't it be great today if Christians and the churches and institutions would just simply say, Jesus is all I need. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time we've spent. Lord, and we realize with the every day of going on, people's lives going 100 miles an hour, rarely do we slow down to hear truth and rarely do we slow down to appropriate truth. Father, this may be the only time this week that you ever get a gospel message. And Father, if this is the only chance and if this is the only opportunity that you're going to get to hear about Jesus, I pray, Father, that we would accept your words, accept your mission, and accept what you want to do in my life. Lord, and understand there are those in this room that God has been prompting you for special service. Perhaps a church membership change. Maybe a rededication. Maybe the Lord has been prompting you that you need to get more deeper involved in the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. And you know that. So many times, Lord, we just kick you to the side and think that we'll do this another time. When the Holy Spirit prompts, it's time to do it right then. Right then. Maybe some of you have been convicted over your finances. You know they're out of whack. And God has been trying to tell you it's time to get those in order. Maybe some of you have been spending more of your time away from home and away from the, away from things that you know that's not right. Father, I pray in this service, If there's a heart that came in here and just wondered, is it possible for me? Is it possible for me to live a life that would please God? Is it possible for me that this hunger and this deep emptiness in my life, could it be filled? Preacher, if you only knew what I live with, if you only knew what the thoughts in my past that that struggle, that I struggle with each day, you'd be surprised. Well, I may be surprised, but God's not. Why don't you give Him a chance and an opportunity? He come back home to give His hometown a chance. Maybe He's coming to Calvary Baptist Church this morning to give you a chance. Maybe some of you just need to be Bible saved. You come in here and your heart is squeezed every week, but you put it off. Now's be a good time to get it done. Now. Father, we pray for everyone that's here. We pray for every heart and every home that's represented. And Father, whatever spiritual decision that needs to be made, I pray this will be the day. Father, show us Your will. Show us Your glory. In Jesus' name. Boone, would you and Miss Dana sing this first verse?